Can I ask a question? If you yeah. Like? So, in real life, I mean, it's interesting to bring up because I'm, I deal with this every day. So I have a competitor who's constantly following us. You know, they're, you know, before you can even think about something, they've thought about it, or vice versa. But, we, but when you're in a, in a competitive situation with a potential client, you know, they're doing apples to apples, right? They can, so you can't avoid that discussion, right? So, I mean, I understand from one perspective that you've got to think about what your clients need. I totally agree with you. But at some point in time, you know, you do end up in a situation where you've got to look at what your competitor is doing because if you don't have that, you're dead. True, but what, what I found <laughs> happens is that when you get into that trap, uh, I call it, you know, the sort of the Me Too syndrome. So that you know the RFPs of the world and things like that are are built for you to, for them to make sure that you check off all the boxes that everybody else checks off. The problem that that happens is that is that is a trap to commodification. Because if everybody's offering the same thing in some variant, then the only reason to choose one company is going to be price, and that becomes the trap. That if you take uh, if you go to the websites of 10 people in an industry and you take the first paragraph when they describe their business and you lay it out on a piece of paper, sort of an old marketing trick, take all the logos away, you won't be able to tell who's who. That's what happens over time. Uh, as a, a CEO told me not too long ago, he said, I always feel like we're playing catch up. And how horrible that they felt about that. And when we worked together, we uncovered what was really great and unique about their company that came from talking to the people inside the company and talking to their customers about why do you use this company. And it turned out the things that he felt that they had to do to compete, their customers never mentioned. Never mentioned. Didn't want them to do that. They loved them in this particular case because of their high degree of compliance that was light years ahead of the rest of the industry, and there was an enormous market for people who just couldn't afford to have any compliance errors in what they were working on. You know, and they, and I, when I came back to them, I said, this is what your clients love you for. You are the best in the country at it. And yet you want to do everything else but that. And you don't want to talk about it. They were relieved. It is who they were. It was something that was valued by their, their customers and, and a large enough market for them to grow. And they, they actually, the they, they business took off over the next nine months, and they got acquired by a company who could never have built that level of compliance and, and needed it to, to grow. So you're never going to forget. You're never not going to see them. But, you know, I remember when I, you know, I always think of it that you cannot lead if you're looking in the rearview mirror. When I, I, I did a talk in, in, in Africa for Coca-Cola uh, a year or so ago, and they were talking about Pepsi, Pepsi, Pepsi. I said, Pepsi doesn't really exist in Africa the way it does here. And even so, you're Coca-Cola. How can you lead and innovate and come up with what's next if you're doing this the whole time? So, I know what's going to happen, but if if you're focused more on what what your market is at, or the things that you're going to do because that's what your market is telling you, what otherwise happens is you're making decisions based on what your competitors are doing, and you're giving them an awful lot of credit for, for actually being right. Who says your competitors actually know what they're doing? How could they know what, what, what you did? If you understand what your purpose is, and your purpose is unique to your business, how could your competitors know what that is? How could they express it the same way? Your business is a collection of personalities and unique points of view that collectively can't be copied by anybody else if you let it out. If you unlock the personality of your business and it has a clear and distinct purpose, it by definition has to be unique. And so, yes, you'll hear what they're doing. A competitor will ask you. Somebody will say, well, we really want that. But that's more of for you to say, well, is that true to our purpose? Is that really what we're going to be the best in the world at? Or do we just want to check every box 
And, and I remember I, I, I worked on a 50-page bid package to GE years ago. And I put it out on the table in binders and everything, and the guy from GE sat down, opened it up, and went to the last page where the pricing was. And then we had an hour-long discussion of you know, grinding us down on the fees. What, what, what else did I have to talk about? We did everything else that our competitors did more or less the same way. So now let's talk about price. Next idea comes from a great book uh, by Ram Charan. So think about Tella from New York. <laughs> Should have a black armband on it. <laughs> but this is, you know, obviously this is about baseball. That, that most companies spend a lot of time trying to think about hitting the home run. <clears throat> How, you know, I, I've talked to companies who, who say, no, we, we uh, I was talking to a, a, a startup who wanted to figure out, their question to me was, how do we get 10,000 customers? And we talked about it, and they said, well, yeah, but the first thing we need to do is we have to have 50. If we have 50, then we're going to get this entire developer community to come on. And we have 26 for it. So I stupidly said, well, why would you and the other executive team spend the next two months taking gift baskets and whatever you have to do to get in front of the other 25 companies that you need to get to 50? And he looked at me and said, I, I want an idea how to get 10,000. But you had to get to 50 first. You had to figure out how to do all those singles and doubles because guess what they add up? Home runs don't happen every day or even every decade. We like to look at the Twitters and the Facebooks and the companies that, that we think you know, hit a home run. But there's a lot of companies out there that just hit singles and doubles and singles and doubles. And guess what? Every once in a while, one turns into a home run. But they're not betting the company. Every day they're thinking about small improvements new things to do, small innovations that don't allow you to bet the whole company on one thing. That quest for the elusive home run often leaves you as a business owner with an extraordinary amount of risk relative to the reward. And it, allow, it sometimes causes companies to wait year, a year to put something out there not knowing what's going to happen instead of executing. There's a, you know, a very popular new book now by Eric Reese about the Lean Startup that's about this constant iteration. Put something out there long before it's done and just iterate, iterate, iterate. Listen to the customers and iterate, iterate, iterate. Because if people know new things are always coming, they'll stick around. In one manner, shape, or form, that's this, you know, one of the secrets of Apple. Is you're never going to get bored with You know something's coming. You don't know what it is, but you know something's coming. this idea of inch by inch. All right? Quote by Gary Player. Next concept is one I learned hard. Right, so I, I will admit I hate sales. Hate it. I've done an awful lot of sales and, and I'm fine sitting at the table, but the idea of picking up the phone and calling and all of that whole sales process of always be closing and, and answering questions and, and uh, trying to turn it around, the whole you know, battle that you're trying to get to get somebody to buy your company just never sat right with me. And so you know, I didn't want to sit down with the phone book and dial for customers all the time. And when I started my uh, the practice I have now, which does coaching and, and strategy work and advisory work, the idea that I was going to have to spend a lot of my time sitting there calling people when I would hate to get me on the other end of that call didn't make sense to me. So I read, uh, I read a great book uh, called Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi that is all about that relationships power business. And personal relationships are the best because the best business relationships are personal. 
And so I spent some time, I spent the next year, this is you know, six or seven years ago, not making a single sales call. Instead, I had coffee with, with people that I knew. I asked them what was going on with their business. What were they working on? What was stressing them out? Where did they want to go with their business? And I kept doing it over and over and over again. Business grew that year two times. Revenue doubled. I didn't make a single sales call. I felt, it felt very natural to me. I didn't feel stressed out about having to do sales. I deepened my relationships with some people. I got to actually know things about customers and people that I otherwise wouldn't have known. Things about their hopes and dreams and fears. And I could provide solutions and build a relationship and deliver an answer on what they really needed. Not what I thought they needed because I was in sales mode. But I could listen to what they needed and go away and come back with a customized solution based on what they really needed. What the real underlying problem or issue or where the value needed to be in the business because I took the time to ask. I never asked them for business. I just built relationships. We all know how to do that. And it takes all the pressure off of that whole stepping on the gas, calling, calling, calling. It happens automatically. It feels counterintuitive, but it becomes this pay it forward thing. People that I developed relationships who then got to know what I was doing and the kind of companies that I was looking to work with would start to send people my way. Maybe it wasn't that time, maybe it was six months later. But it, but it works. So think about, I'm sorry. Again. Go, go back. Sorry. So, you know, the, the general rule is that the 80 20 rule still applies. I think if there's 20% of your contacts in your network that probably deliver 80% of all your business. If you think, if you wrote down how you got, if you took your, your entire customer list, and you wrote down how you got those customers, you're going to find it's a very finite group of people relative to the amount of people that you're trying to reach. So focus on that 20%. What can you do for that 20%? How can you connect with them, get to know them, understand their birthdays, their, what their kids are doing, what their fears are, where they want their business to go, and watch what happens. Next idea is about why things don't seem to get done in business. Why projects and our focus on to-do lists and getting things done is the wrong way to think about progress. So consider this. 